Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick. Today, we're going to take a look at some of the pitfalls when you know, working with GraphQL and some of the issues that you can have uh, regarding performance and some ticks and techniques that you can use to avoid some of these issues. Uh, but yeah, just uh, before doing that, uh, just a bit by myself. My name is Patrick. I'm a developer advocate at Apollo GraphQL. We do quite a bit of open source tooling around uh, GraphQL, but um, today the talk is going to be mostly about something else, uh, some like non-Apollo technology. Um, but I'm also one of the organizers of PyCon Italia. I really love this Python community. I'm really happy to be also at PyCon UK. And I created Strawberry GraphQL, which is an open source library uh, that allows you to create GraphQL APIs using uh, Python and type ins. Uh, we're not going to see much of that, just maybe a slightly bit of code. Uh, this talk is more about GraphQL in general. So what is GraphQL? Um, before talking about, you know, uh, the performance stuff, I just wanted to introduce you to some of the reasons why GraphQL was created. And GraphQL was created as an API technology by Facebook in uh, 2012, and then it's been released as open source. Now it's governed by a foundation, uh, so you can use it for free. But it's pretty much an, um, a way for you to fetch data from, from a server um, and get the data on a client. So compared to REST, uh, we have REST on the left and uh, GraphQL on the right. Um, in, in REST, Traditionally, you have multiple endpoints where you can you know, choose an endpoint to fetch a specific set of data. For example, here there's players, teams, and matches. So if you go to slash players, you get information about the player. In GraphQL, this is quite different. Uh, you have one single endpoint where you basically send a document and you describe the data that you want to fetch. Uh, and this is enabled by the, the schema. Uh, GraphQL schema looks something like this, where you define all the types that are available in the schema. And in this case, the most important type is the query one. And it's a type that tells you all the data you can start fetching from your API. So in this case, we are able to fetch a list of films and also film by ID. And then for the film, we could get the ID, the title, and the locations. And the way you get data from GraphQL is by sending a document that looks pretty much like this. Um, so here we're saying, I want to do a query. So I want to get some data. And I want to get a film with that specific ID. And then for the film, I want to fetch the ID, title, URL, and then the locations. And for the location, I want to get the ID and the name. And when I send this query, um, the server is going to return something like this back, uh, which is exactly the same shape of uh, what I sent, which is really, really cool and really uh, powerful. And, you know, oops. Uh, GraphQL is uh, pretty much a declarative technology, so you declare the data you want to fetch. And this, uh, the declarative nature of GraphQL solves a couple of problems. The first one is overfetching, which is the issue of you know, having an API that returns way too much data. This is quite common in pretty much any API that you can work with, especially in the REST world, is that you have, for example, an endpoint that's slash film, and that's going to return a lot of data that you might need. So for example, if you have an API, uh, a page that needs only the ID and the uh, title of the film, uh, with GraphQL, you can send a query like this, and it's going to return just the ID and the title without any additional uh, data. And the other problem is quite the opposite, which is underfetching. You might have an API that doesn't return enough data, leading you to request uh, much more data. Uh, well, we're doing multiple requests to get the data that you want to fetch. For example, this is solved by GraphQL again by allowing you to specify exactly the data that you need all at once. And you know this. The clarity in nature is really good uh, for kind of consumers of the API. It, it makes it very easy to fetch all data that you need to fetch at once without you know, having to worry about you know, going through multiple endpoints and doing any kind of data coordination. But on the back end, this makes things quite a bit more complicated because we are shifting all the complexity in, uh, um, to, towards our back end, pretty much. So I wanted to divide this talk in kind of what can we do as API developers to improve this, uh, this or to solve this issue. And also, what can libraries do? So this is also pretty much an inspiration for myself to, to improve Strawberry over time to make it easier to fix some of the performance uh, stuff that we have. So let's start with what can we do. And the first problem that is quite common in, in GraphQL, uh, both in REST, I guess, is the n plus 1 problem. And so if we take a look at this uh, query here, we can imagine that this could translate pretty much easily to a like, single SQL query or maybe two SQL query in our database. But unfortunately, this is not the case when, when you use GraphQL, because GraphQL, the execution of uh, GraphQL is done level by level. So when I send this query, I'm pretty, pretty much saying, fetch me the films. And then when you're done fetching the films, fetch me the locations. Um, and I'm going to show you a demo of this. Switched up. 
Okay, so here I have um, a pretty basic uh, GraphQL API that allows me to fetch fields and also people. We're going to see the people in um, field pretty much because I've been working with that. Um, this tool is called Graphical, which allows us to pretty much test uh, GraphQL APIs uh, without having to, to write any code, pretty much. Um. Okay. So, as I mentioned, you can send a document that looks like this. So, for example, here I can say I want to fetch all the people, and then for every person I want to fetch their name, um, and, and something like this. So. So this works, and it's quite nice. I'm, I'm using Django and Django Develop Toolbar, so that allows me to see the number of uh, SQL queries that I'm doing. Now, this is pretty basic, and it's fetching you know, just one single query from the database. But as soon as I start doing the planet for this person, and I have three versions of this, because it's going to see different versions of the uh, optimizing the, this uh, field. If I use the one that's not optimized, um, this is going to lead to the n, one, n plus one problem. Because for every single person, it's going to do a query to the database to fetch the uh, planet and the planet name. So if I do this, uh, getting all the data that works, uh, we can see there's 83 queries, which is definitely not ideal, because this is doing way too many round trips to your database. So, um, the first way to solve this is by using lookahead. And lookahead is pretty much a, um, a pattern to basically look at what the query is fetching and then basically doing optimization based on that. So uh, again, I'm going to show you the code of this. Um, uh, so let me close this quickly. Oh, there we go. So this is the, um, this is the code that's responsible for fetching the, uh, all the people from my API. So now this is using Django and Survey, but like, that doesn't matter too much. The, the important thing here is that we have this info field. Uh, parameter. So if I put a breakpoint here and I try to run this query, let me try again. So now I have access to all this information. If I take a look at info, I can see that this is pretty much all the context of my request. So now there is quite a bit of code. So let me show you the selection, selected field. So this is pretty much what we can use to uh, optimize this query because here we have all the access to. Um, access to all the things that someone has been requested. So I can see that someone, um, the query has requested all people, and then inside of people, I'm fetching the name, and then the homework unoptimized. And so I could use this information to maybe do select related or prefetch related, or to change the, date, the, the way I'm fetching data, uh, which is um, really cool and really useful for, um, again, optimizing these things. Um, I'm going to remove this breakpoint. But there is also one kind of uh, solution out of this. Uh, if you're using Survey and Survey Django, there is a built-in optimizer that pretty much does this all, all for you. Um, and the main reason why I would say is this is because it's already built and there's quite a bit of code to do this because you have to traverse the, the, the selection set and it's quite annoying to do. Um, and so if I uh, fetch the onward, the, the standard one, which is coming you know, straight from, from Django, um, this is going to be much better because uh, it's going to be only one query. Um, so, uh, Subray Django with the optimizer is basically able to analyze the, the things that you're fetching and it knows also where this is coming from. So, it's able to uh, pretty much uh, add the select related here. So, it's doing the automatic join here. And also, the other benefit of using the, the Subray Django version is that, uh, for example, in my fetching uh, maybe the see, birth here. If I'm running a query like this, the SQL is going to be pre-optimized because it's only going to fetch the name, the birth here, and the ID. So even, even the single individual select is going to be extremely optimized, which is really cool. Um, unfortunately, this only works if your schema matches your database, um, which is um, not really that common, especially if you have an um, API that's quite large and you have a lot of use cases. GraphQL has been designed to be more than a way to, sh to fetch data from the back end, it's more a way to expose use cases. So it, what you're going to expose might not match what you're having in the database, or it might be quite different. So the other solution for this, which is more agnostic, is called data loaders. And data loaders are pretty much a way to batch data fetching. So instead of fetching um, things one at a time, you pretty much uh, put it them in a queue, and then you fetch them just a moment later. Um, and again, I'm going to show a demo for this. Uh, it's going to be. Uh, be easier to understand. So 
have the same field by using the data loader pattern, and this is going to return the same data, but it's going to be um, optimized in a different way. So what, what is happening here is I'm fetching all the people, and then for every single person I'm saying I want to fetch the planet ID, their, their home world, but that fetching is not going to be immediately. It's going to be done just in the next event loop, and that's going to uh, use async I.O. So show, show the queries how it works. So the first, first query that we do, fetch all the people, standard, and then we fetch all the planets uh, with the IDs that we, we passed inside our resolver. Um, so that's uh, the other optimization. And I can show you how this works. So inside um, the person model, so I, as I mentioned, I have the homeworld and optimized. This is just doing a query to Django. Then there is the standard homeworld, which is uh, optimized automatically. And then there's this one, this version with data loader, which is algorithm is not really doing much because all the data fetching is hidden inside the data loader. So the first thing we're doing is pretty much getting the loader from the context, and the context is a shared variable between all the resolvers, pretty much like a request in Django. Um, and then I'm saying wait uh, and load the, um, the planet with this ID. And then interesting part is exactly in the data loader. So here we're using a cache property to, to make sure that we only have one single data loader per request and it's shared between multiple resolvers. Because if you would create a data loader per resolver, this optimi optimization would not, would not work. Um, and then what I'm doing here, there's a bit of magic for making it work for Django with AsyncIO. But other than that, I'm just saying um, I receive a list of IDs and then I'm fetching that list of IDs and returning the results from that. And that's pretty much it. The API of data loader is quite simple. Uh, and it's almost like magic if you haven't seen the code. The code is also, I mean, you can take a look. There's quite a bit of code here, but the gist of the data loader is that uh, when you do load, it pretty much stores uh, all the IDs that you want to fetch inside a variable, and then it uses asyncio saying, go and fetch this data in the next event loop. Um, and that, that pretty much works like this. So it fetches first the people, and then fetches the, the planets. Okay. We can also chat more about this um, in person, so we might not have enough time. So the recap for the N plus one problem is we can read the query to optimize our data fetching. So we can see why someone has been selected, and we can use that information to do some prefetching and um, things like that. And Survey Django does that for you. So if you have Django, uh, this, um, it's easy to, to implement. We might do the same for SQL Alchemy at some point in the future. Um, but you can also use data loaders if you have APIs that really don't match your database schema. For example, if you have a GraphQL API that sits on top of a REST API, uh, that's another pattern. This data loaders works pretty much uh, with any data source, as long as you can do batch fetching. Um, the next problem I wanted to talk about is caching. Caching is quite um, there's quite a lot of questions about caching in, in GraphQL because GraphQL uses POST by default. So when you're doing a request to a GraphQL server, you're usually sending a POST request that makes caching quite difficult because you, know, you cannot use traditional CDN for caching and you also cannot use the browser default caching because it's a POST request and you know, POST request should not be cached by default. Uh, there, are, there, is, there is some CDNs or like GraphQL specific CDN that allow you to do this, uh, but I wanted to show you how you can avoid using them. Uh, before talking about some things we can do, I just wanted to do an aside on the fact that most GraphQL client libraries already have a way to, to cache things on, on the client. So for example, Apollo client, I think I have a link here. Uh, here we go. So, Apollo client is just one of the clients, many clients that do this, but pretty much when you send a request, uh, for example, to get a book here, it tries to fetch it from the cache. If it's not in the cache, it goes into the server, and then it caches it. Uh, and then the next time you try to fetch that specific book, it, and, um, it reads it from the cache. So you already have some, um, some good benefit from just using um, a library like this. It's, it's quite nice. There's also quite a few other benefits, but we don't have time, unfortunately, to go into that. Um, cool. But you know, even if GraphQL uses POST by default, uh, we can still use GET. And in fact, Survey allows GET requests um, um, by default, I think. Um, but when you do a GET request, you still have to send the, the old document via query parameter. And there's a couple of problems with that. The, the first one is that you, 
might ha end up having a URL that's too long and doesn't fit the uh, URL limit. Uh, that happens, unfortunately. And the other one is that we're sending a huge payload for the query, so there's also an opportunity for improvement there. So the first thing that we can do for, well, the main thing that we can do for this is using something called persistent queries. And it basically changes the way GraphQL works by instead of sending a document, you send an ID that connects to that document. Um, and so I also have a demo for this, um, probably easier. So, yeah. If I change my request to be like query equals, for example, hello. So this is going to work. Now it's going to fail because I don't have a hello field, but the gist is pretty much that you can send a get request and get data from your server without having to go through post. Uh, which gives you the benefit of being able to use a CDN. Uh, but on top of that, you can also um, use uh, a query ID, in this case, for example, one. Uh, the fact that I'm passing a query like this here is because I have a bug in my code that I need to fix, hopefully, at some point. Um, let's see. Oh, I changed the query. Let me, let me actually, I have two bugs now. Um, let me go quickly and fix that. Uh, but I can show you the code in the meanwhile. So one thing I, I didn't show you before is that a survey has a concept of scheme extension. So for example, here, um, we have one for Django. This is how the Django optimizer works. He hooks into the uh, execution of your GraphQL API, and then he optimizes things. Uh, but we also have one called uh, persistent query extension, which is very basic um, and really doesn't do much. He basically checks if there is a query ID in the request, and then uses that to, to fetch the query. Otherwise, it returns an error. Um, and now this is the query that I have wrong. Um, so I'm pretty much mapped. I have a map of queries from yeah, ID to the actual query. So now, hopefully, if I go here and I do query equals, uh, sorry, A and query ID. Oh, that should work. Yeah. And this is how, again, how we can truly optimize a GraphQL query using get. Uh, there is there's one additional benefit of this is that if you have a good CI step to pretty much collect these queries. Uh, you also prevent some issues with security because you can only allow query by these in production. And so you get kind of the benefits of GraphQL in development, but also you get all the safety of using just you know specific uh, list of queries in, in production. Uh, oops, wrong one. Cool. The, the main issue with this is that uh, we need a way to get to those persistent queries. As I mentioned, I have a list of queries inside my code, which is probably something you wouldn't do. You maybe would store them into a database or have a, a build step that allows you to, um, you know, build your front end, your clients, and then store those uh, queries somewhere. Um, it's a bit tricky, but it's, uh, it's used a lot, in, especially in like a large scale company, it's used a lot. There is also one additional version of this, which is called automatic persistent queries. Uh, which is supported, again, by many clients. And uh, as I mentioned, I do have the docs for Apollo client because it's um, those are quite nice and easier to understand. But basically, automatic persistent queries um, um, is basically a way to automate this um, process of storing the query by ID. So when I use Apollo client with this or any other client and I'm sending a query, Apollo sends hash of the query, like optimistically saying, oh, this, this query is already cached or saved into the store. And then if the server doesn't have it, it sends an error. And then Apollo tries to send, again, the query and the hash so that the server can store it, execute it, and then return the result. And then after a while, I just send the ID again. And then now that, that ID is saved, and I can return the query. Um, and so this is, again, a pretty uh, easy way to, to optimize, um, to get persistent query without having to write um, a build step or a pipeline like that. So, just a recap for this. Um, we have five minutes, right? Uh, okay, I'm gonna be quick. Um, GraphQL uses post that by default, which doesn't really allow us to use CDN, and we cannot leverage process caching. But clients, uh, you know, front-end clients, but also clients for iOS, Android, they have a way to uh, leverage caching in, in memory, like normalized cache, so you can even persist it if you need to. Uh, but you can still enable GraphQL via GET. Um, and then you can use persistent queries to 
uh, use uh, queries via an ID, so that gets you some security, but also uh, you send less data to your backend. And there is a way to uh, optimize even further automatic persistent query by uh, automating the process of storing those, those queries. Um, yeah, there is quite a bit more for caching. We don't have a lot of time, but um, if you want to chat about that, I'll be to, to chat anytime. There is um, one thing, a couple of things I wanted to mention more. Like yesterday, there was a great talk about uh, adding metrics to your code, and I would recommend to use uh, one of those tools. Uh, I use Sentry mostly uh, to basically pretty much understand the things I need to optimize in my, my code base. So again, I do have an example of this. Uh, because GraphQL is pretty um, annoying to, to optimize sometimes, especially, you can see here, there is um, there's just a list of post requests, but um, maybe not this one. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. Here, for example, I do have a basic GraphQL request. And you can see all the things that ha have happened there. So if you have a request that's quite com complex and it has a lot of fields, you can see all the fields and how much time they, they took. Uh, and this, this has been implemented, again, as a schema extension, as you may have seen before. This is Sentry 1. Uh, it basically looks into every single a field that you have, and it sends metrics to Sentry, so you're able to kind of see all the resolvers that slow. Again. Uh, and then there is uh, other things like preventing misuse. This is not really strictly co connected to performance, um, but it's something that's going to make your um, your API a bit safer and also prevents you know, people from DDoSing you, uh, uh, disrupting your performance. So the first kind of op op option that you can have to prevent people from doing weird things is to limit the query depth. Uh, and you know, GraphQL is quite fle flexible and it could allow you to do a query like this, or even worse, you know, fetching a lot of fields and nested fields and that. So that's never gonna be, you're never gonna be able to optimize something like that because it doesn't even make sense to, to do something like that. So it only makes sense for someone to, to to attack you. Uh, so this is something that you can enable pretty quickly in Strawberry. There is an extension, again, to say, I want to only allow people to fetch maximum 10 levels of next thing. Um, then the other option is to do something called query complexity, where you basically give a weight to every single field, and you calculate how much that query could cost in terms of you know, data being fetched. So for example, here, I'm saying I want to fetch the first 50 film, and for every fifth film, I want to fetch the location. And so you can calculate the complexity as being 50 for this field, because there is every film is going to be one, then one for the ID, one for the title, uh, 10 for the location, because it's 10 of them, and then one for the ID name, and so on. And then you kind of sum this, multiply them based on the nesting, and then you get a, a number that's like this, and then you can decide, you know, I only want to allow a maximum 3,000 uh, cost every five minutes. Um, unfortunately, this is not yet, uh, it's not yet implemented in survey. This is something I was working on uh, yesterday. It's not too complicated. I've seen some people implementing on their own in their custom code base, because it's, again, it's not too difficult, and maybe some people want to customize it quite often. But I think we're going to have this soon, hopefully in the next month or so. So I think I'm pretty much out of time, right? Um, yeah, we, yeah, there's, there's some things uh, I wanted to mention about what libraries can do, but I guess we could talk about this um, in person, but you know, we can optimize the, some of the parts of GraphQL uh, that are slow at the moment, like the validation and the parsing and also returning the results. Um, there's also potentially of changing the execution engine of GraphQL. There was a talk at the conference, GraphQL Conf last week, uh, about a new uh, feature engine it's called Graphast, which changes how you execute GraphQL queries. Instead of running resolvers, you describe how you did it's going to fetch, and then there is um, like classes, Python classes that allow you to optimize things. It's really cool, but unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this. Uh, so I'm going to leave you uh, hopefully some time for questions, and here's my links. Thank you, everyone.